Amen. Precious blood. Yes. Come on, just repeat stand. Use it now too quick. Let's, ex let's get excited about the blood. We will get a chance to sit in a minute. time in the Lord I got a chance to sit down and get ministered to and sat there in the front row and receive revelation on top of revelation on top of revelation I'm telling you God was moving like mightily in this church last Saturday last Sunday and I'm excited because I get a chance to sit down and listen what the Spirit of the Lord was saying to this church and that said and done, I've said, Lord, what do you want me to begin with this week? After such a gracious time in you, the mighty men of God came and delivered such awesome messages. We had a great time. Some folks was ordained into their destiny, to their ministry that God has called them to do. It was an awesome time in that ordination. And um, that word ordination, if you looked it up, ordinar, in the Greek word, it means 
to put in place. So some folks was put in their place where they belong and God in order to do that some mighty men came. I've never seen so much apostle in one place all my life <laughs> being a Christian and prophets all these people you know a lot of people ask me pastor what does all this mean what is the what who is an apostle who is a prophet what does the scripture say on these things what, what are these people represent in the in the bible well here at Pure Heart Church we usually have ministry classes when you join this church you become a disciple of Christ everybody know what a disciple is right a disciple is not just an ordinary Christian no. a disciple is a learned one or a follower of Christ a disciple don't just get born again and just relax a disciple pursue Christ with all his heart a disciple grow and that's why Christ had disciples they were learning from him they were following him and learning everything they could so a disciple in Christ is also known the Bible said by this you will know that they are my disciples you want to know what that thing is <clears throat> their love for one another their love for one another what distinguished Christ's disciples from all people of the earth is the dimension of love that they have for one another. Amen, amen. So if you don't love your neighbor, if you don't love one another, maybe you're just a Christian. <laughs> but if you want to go into the dimension of being a disciple, you got to love one another. Amen. By this you will know them. His prayer for us was father make them one as we are one Amen. our example is one and so we become one as they are one the trinity they stick together Amen. so today's message i'm going to deal with a little teaching that i do in the ministry classes for some folks have not been to the ministry classes but if you've been to ministry classes you will get this teaching so you will understand what the fivefold ministry is Pastor, that ain't always saying it. Oh, this is a fivefold ministry, deliverance ministry. And so she used these words, and somebody said, What is that fivefold ministry? Today, I'm going to bring clarity to this about the fivefold ministry and what the purpose is. Because you have some theologians that says some of these offices are needed no more, so they are out of the church. So we're going to study the scriptures and see if this is real if this is what they're saying is true and if why does Christ come and gave some to be occupying these offices I want to tell you in the body of Christ that you can't just get up one day and say I want to be a prophet <laughs> you can't just get up one day and say mm, I want to be an apostle it's not something that you could feel as if you want or you know some people says you know I mean I, I, I just feel a strong drawing to that office no you are born to be a prophet or an apostle it's by the will of God and that man that you become so man can put you in this position by the will of God by the will of God I want to put on the screen before me Romans chapter 1 and we'll start at verse 1 I want you to just peep at this Paul a servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God say again uh, Paul first is a what servant of Jesus 
Jesus said, if you want to be great, you must be a servant. The disciples was quarreling who was going to be greater in the kingdom. And Jesus said, stop it. You want to be great among men? Start serving. Servanthood. You want to be served, you must first serve. And Paul said he's in an office. That's This is a serious office. But he says he had to be a servant and he had to be called to be an apostle. Who called him? Jesus Christ. Man cannot call you. When you have a calling, a lot of people have a calling to this office, but they're never commissioned to it. Mm. You can have a calling and not embrace or accept the call. You can have a calling and play with it for a little while. I think I did a little bit of that. I was running away from that calling. It seemed too high for me. <laughs> it was a high calling. And I said, who am I? And But God always called those people who think they're low because they're the humble people that are teachable for the calling. And so preparation is needed Preparation is needed for this calling, to build character, to maintain these callings. Amen. Preparation is needed. There is a serious area here where God is, wants to mature the body. You give someone authority, man, they can abuse that authority. There's bosses right now in the marketplace that they lord over them employees they treat them like garbage because they have got a position that they were not prepared for that they have no character to maintain so many has fallen in the politics and all these things because of the position they hold they had no character to so they end up falling from that place but when God puts you in a place he's called you to a place he prepares you for that position preparation is greatest friend Greatest allies. And a man prepared by God, now this devil's worst nightmare because this man is not easily tossed and driven. He's not easily shaken with every wind of doctrine. He's not easily shaken with the storms of life. He's not easily moved. He's not like the wave of the sea, tossed and driven. Jacob, all this son, was Reuben. And when Father blessed him, he said, Oh, Reuben unstable as water check it from Reuben Lyons you see no great men rose because of this he wasn't stable he didn't have that stability but I want to get here to this scripture because here you see a servant he's called and he's set apart now when we are called Christ set us apart whom he justifies he sanctifies and who he sanctifies oh my god he glorifies so between God's call and glorification there is a sanctification that means a process of cleansing a process of purification last week we were here and there the, I don't know if anybody noticed it but the water in the community was cut off so God, I was in there going, God, one of the biggest service here in the week of the month, and there's no water. I said, God, how are we going to keep this place clean and sanctified? Bathrooms and everything. And Lord said, go ahead. And let, uh, Ron went over here and got some big jugs, man, five gallon water. So every time somebody go in the bathroom, he go in there behind. Clean. Water. Wash it. Water. Cleanse it. Water. Wash. Cleanse. So after the service was finished, we looked outside, we saw that the hydrant was just open and water was just flooding the parking lot. And so it came to me as a man of God was preaching from the night before the Saturday, Apostle uh, was preaching a message, Apostle Sweeley said that Jacob dug wells and the enemy closed it up, dug wells, closed it up. And the last well that he dig, they did not stop it up. 
So in that well gave out to Jacob, his inheritance came to his son, Jacob. So the man of God came the next Sunday morning, no water. He's giving a testimony of him taking over the city, being a mayor, but the places that he wanted to take over, there was no water. He had problem with the water. So as he's preaching, we have problem in the church with no water. So we're getting a divine revelation here of the enemy blocking what belongs to you. Water represents living rivers of water, represent the word of God in your life, flow. That's why I said you'd be like the tree planted by the rivers of water. So it's a constant fresh supply coming to you of revelation and understanding of God and who he is. And so, man, this thing was so clouded up, up here. And after the preaching was done, I heard the um, man of God went over there and he said, look, there's flood outside. And he, Jacob, it was his uh, minister, Jason's son was by his side standing up. As Jacob well, remember the, uh, this, uh, the wells from Isaac came to who? Jacob. And then he saw the truck outside said, Jacob. And then the flood came in. So what God was saying, there is an alignment that happened. God came in and he poured out last week. There's something that dropped upon this church Amen. that will take it to the next dimension. Amen. And it's like the flood of a water, a supply that's amply supplied. Amen. And the water now, listen, the real meaning why they open an hydrant is this, to flush it out. When a line is break, they connect it, dirt get in it. Impurities get in it. Anybody know what impurities? The Bible said the dross must be taken out of the silver before the silver cement uses it. The dross means the impurities must be taken. So when the silver cement is in that place, the crucible is hot and it's got that heat that brings that thing to the surface. You ever know that sometimes to test the real you is when you're under pressure? Come on, come on now. You want to know if you're sanctified? Check yourself when you're under pressure. Because when that heat touches that silver, it comes to the top. And guess what? The silver cement don't go away and then he come back to look. He stays there in the heat while it is done. He's watching. He's watching and he skims off the impurities. That's how God do in our lives. He take out the impurity. He's there with us through the trials, through the testing, through the times of purification. And he sanctifies, and he cleanses, and he washes, and he makes whole, and he's preparing you for use. So when does he know when the silver is ready? When he can see himself in it. Hallelujah. The silver smith said, now this is material. Ah, oh, this is good now. This is good for me to use now. It's usable because I can see myself in it. When Christ sanctifies you and he wants to glorify himself through you, when someone see you, they see Christ. When Jesus came, he said, if you see me, you see who? The Father. He was a representation of the Father. And so he's in you now, so you are a representation of Christ while he's a representative of the Father. So Paul said, it's not I that live, but Christ who lives in me. In other words, he's dead so Christ can reign. <laughs> somebody, Raxon was telling me this week, somebody asked for captain the other day. And she said, she said, she told him, captain is dead. Pastor Ricky is alive. <laughs> captain was the old bike crew leader who is the lead 50 men, the warriors we call them, Miami warriors. And she said, Captain is dead. When you come to church, you're going to see Pastor Ricky. <laughs> so the impurities is taken out. So that's a sign. When they flushed the hydrant was a sign that the water was coming out. Flushing out all impurities so that the real deal, the purity. So what the apostle is saying is that he's, he was, number one, he is a servant. He's called and he's set apart. For God's use. You'll never see again. In the whole testament of this book. You'll never see him using this term again. Every time you see him again. You will see. He will say Paul. An apostle. 
of the Lord Jesus Christ called by the will of God. What happened? He humbled himself as a servant. He got himself set apart. Now, that was called being in the will of God. Being in the what? Will of God. Amen. So ultimately, his process was to get in the will of God. So in Romans, he's called here and he's telling you why. First book he's written here and now he's writing and he's telling you this is what I'm called to do. And you see him again. Now in Philippians, you will see him say, again, he will say, he will not say uh, um, uh, this thing set apart again. He will say, Paul and Timothy. And they will talk. The reason why. Then he will say, now, servant of the Lord, called by God for this work. So he said, the God the Father has called us. So you read this and study it. It is the will of God for us to walk in the calling that he has given. Today I will show you the importance of the calling. And I'll tell you a little bit about this fivefold ministry gift and what is it called. First of all, God designed us, oh, in a specific way. The Bible said we're made in the image of God. After the image of God, doesn't mean that image as physical body but spiritually after God for he made man first spiritually then he took the earth what's on earth because man was designed to rule in the what earth so he took the earth and he made the man and then he blew heaven in the man his spirit pneuma and the man became a living soul so really the man is a spirit being he possesses a soul and he lives in a body. Amen. Why is it that this body must go back to the ground? Because that's when it came, it must return. Yes. But what is spirit must return. Mm. So your spirit and your soul will go with Christ. And he will give you a body for that dimension. This body cannot go there. And so God has given us things on us to demonstrate that he made us. He put his hand on us. If you know these seven sockets in, in your head represent the perfection of God. You are made in perfection. If you notice, the hand has five fingers, the toes, a man, for five toes on each uh, leg. The reason why, why you foot have five toes, why you have five, it always reminding you of the grace of God. And it reminds you of the fivefold ministry gift, which is the hand of God to guide his church. Mm, Jesus. The hand of God to guide his church. Now, when you look at the hand, it's very important, powerful, because each one of these fingers represent one of those ministry gifts. Now, you have ministry gifts, you have gifts that are given, motivational gifts, gifts that are given. And you have gifts that are given by manifestation of the Holy Spirit. These are nine gifts of the Spirit. Gift of wisdom. Gift of knowledge. Gift of prophecy. Then you have gift of faith. Gift of healing. Gift of signs, wonders, and miracles. Then you have gift of discernment. Gift of tongue and interpretation of tongue. Nine gifts. Notice you have nine fruit to match the nine gifts. The fruit is developed. The gift is given. You're always going to, God Christ is always going to develop you in your calling. So you have the nine fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness is towards God. Humble yourself on the right hand of God. And you have temperance, which is your temper on the restraint, your anger on the restraint. And humility is power on the restraint. And faithfulness, don't, don't forget it, it's the fruit of the Spirit. Because God bless faithfulness. To faith and patience you inherit promises. And so these are different. So the, it's not, so the, 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 the manifestation gifts is not the given the Holy Spirit. The, these ascension gifts are given the fivefold by Christ to the church. To equip the church, to prepare the church. I want to tell you that what their functions are. You do not know someone by their title. You know someone by their function. You know them by the fruit. 
Fruit is produced. So what the life is producing is the fruit. You know them by their function. How they function. How they function. Are you functioning in the gift that you said match your title? I want you to pay close attention to what I'm saying to you today. You will learn something today. Amen. Hand of God. The Apostle. Notice. Huh? 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 At all time, I can touch any finger with this. You will understand why in a minute. the finger you use all the time to do your pointing and man of God speak you see you you're called to be an intercessor you know what God has his hand on you God said he'll never leave and say you live to old age God will bless you supernaturally sickness shall not take you out in Jesus name God said this is your time and your season for you to reign Notice the next one is longer than all the fingers. Uh, that's the evangelist. Goes beyond this church. The next one, the pastor. Notice which ring, which hand the ring is on. You know what that represent? Love and covenant. The pastor, you made covenant with God. Pastor is responsible for shepherding you, equipping you. There's a vein that goes directly to the heart from the ring finger. He's a lover. I will go, I will go into this with, in depth for you. I'll show you some things about this. God know what he was doing, using this. And the next finger is the little finger. It's the smallest finger, but it's the most effective finger if you want to get anything small. Ears, nose, notice this is the finger you use to get in small places because there's something specific about this even though it's so small it's effective that's the teacher he adds stability to your life when he teach you you understand so the apostle he could what he could prophesy he could evangelize he could mm, pastor and he could what teach but did you see that apostle called any pastor? Did you see him called a, 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 a teacher? Anywhere there? Throughout the whole scripture, you never see the apostle Paul called an evangelist. Paul, a servant of the Lord Jesus, said, called to be an apostle, set apart. But yet, he can function in all these gifts. Why is it that he's so powerful? Jesus Christ was the first apostle. Apostle is the word apostolesco, which means sent ones. Meaning they used to send people and from different colonies into different colonies to rule and to set and to establish the colony. And so those were called the sent ones, the soldiers and the captains who were sent. And so that word is called my sent one. So God sent Jesus and Jesus sent the twelve. And the twelve sent others, and it keeps sending and sending. So the apostle, the word means sent ones. So when they, when God sent them to you, is for a purpose, and I want you to understand this. Why so many of them was here at Pure Heart Church? Sent ones. You'll never see this. You're not here. So at the church of Antioch, listen to this. While Paul was there, he prophesied to the people, he evangelized the people, he pastored them for a season, and he taught them the word of God. And yet he's never called an evangelist. He's always called an apostle. Because you can only occupy one office. You can function in them for a time and season. Pastor, I might be pastoring here now, functioning this gift. For a season, maybe for a season at a time. And maybe God might say, no, this is what you're really called to hear. But you have to function there to help in your building grow to get where God wants you. 
so you can be functioning in it. Yes, but there you are called to one. You're not all five. Now, where did theologians go off now to say that God has done away with two and left three? Just imagine right now, somebody come to cut off on your natural hand, two of your fingers, the two most important fingers you got, strongest fingers that you have. Cut them off and left you with three. That's what happened with the church. After the apostles set the church, cut off these two, so the church didn't have the inspired word because they said this is inspired word of God so this is good enough but without the prophet to give you a rhema because this is what logos so when the prophet speak to you you will get a rhema word it's a right now speaking word for what you're going through to take you out of it and into your destiny so the fresh supply it'll be like giving you some fresh supply which the word of God is always fresh when you get into it but then it still have the Holy Spirit have to still bring his revelation to you. But there is still the audible revelation that comes to the prophet to inspire you. Or to pull you out of complacency. Or to set you in position that we need in the church. So getting rid of these is making the church weak. Weak. Just like if you try to pick this up with the three fingers and hand. I might have to use another hand to help wrap while I could just grab this thing with these two fingers is so important they might approach things different but they have the same agenda so the prophet they have similar and the apostles have similar attributes but they approach things different mm. but they are accomplishing the same goal so I want to tell you today if they have cut off the prophet and the apostle listen to this Jesus gave 12 apostles they said oh the apostles was just there for the setting up and the foundation which the scripture said the apostle and prophet laid the foundation the scriptures that we have today they're the one laid the New Testament foundation and Christ being the cornerstone so Christ was inspiring them to lay it but they said after it's been laid they finished with it no if they were there just to write the scriptures and give them to us then why is only three of them wrote the scriptures who walked with Jesus the original 12 only three Matthew John and Peter is the only one who wrote the scriptures so that means the others would be failures because they didn't write will God raise up for failures he would put them there just for a reason. Say, okay, you're just supposed to write the scripture and then get rid of them. No. That means they are to continue functioning in the body. Every part of this body means something. And need, you need it. The hand can't say to the eye, I don't need you. I guarantee you, if I drop a little brick on your toe, you hear your mouth say, ah! Your brain start racing, your eyes start looking, and your hands start grabbing. They're working together for a common goal to fix the problem. That's what the function is. When there's a problem in the body, we need the apostles, we need the prophets to set things back in order. We need the prophets to prophesy the word of God. We need the fivefold ministry to keep the church in order. That's why the church is the state that is in, because you kick them out. Kind of like how we kick out prayer out of school now. We have all these problems in school. Kick it out of government. You have a problem in government. We need the hand of God in every situation. And when you see the purpose of this, or why they were instituted, and why they were called, you'll know that those three, now out of the 27 books of the New Testament, we had 39 of the Old Testament. The prophet was visible and more powerful. You could hear him in the Old Testament because the, 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 the five books of Moses, which makes up the Torah, you had the Psalms and the prophets. So the prophet was one who bring the inspiration word from God directly. Mouthpiece for the Lord. I tell you, in the New Testament, you are now king. Mm -hmm. Prophet and priest. I said, oh, pastor, what are you saying? The Lord is a king. And he said, I'll be the king of kings. 
So kings on the earth really means you are his offspring. You're his representatives. And so in, when you face Satan, you face him as a king. You, face, you decree a thing and it shows shall establish. You face him with authority. But he was, Jesus said, I've given you the authority to cast out a devil, to lay hand on the sick and they shall recover. And priests, royal priests are the peculiar people. Priests know how to set up fragrance to God. They know how to worship God. They know how to honor God. They know what God needs and they give it to Him. And you get up every day and you better prophesy. You don't have to be a prophet to prophesy. You don't have to be in the office of a prophet. You have the office of prophet, but all believers should prophesy. So prophesying is speaking forth the will of God, which is the word of God. So every believer is a prophet of their confession. You get up every day and say, I prophesy that I am dead free. I live free because Christ has redeemed me from poverty. He has redeemed me from death. He has redeemed me from sickness. And therefore, I declare that today is my day. I command mountains to be removed in Jesus' name. I prophesy death freedom in my life. I prophesy victory to my destiny. You better be prophesying to yourself. Amen. And you better be prophesying to people. Say, I'm not a prophet, I can prophesy. Take the word of God and speak it to somebody. That's prophesying. I'm going to show you now. The office of a prophet is a different thing. But they're the mouthpiece. They can speak for God. They can then. When they speak to God, back them up. There's some times when the apostle Paul would say, Oh, this is what the Lord says. And then he sometimes said, Not the Lord, I said. And it's just as good as the Lord said, because when he said, I say, he's saying from a mature state of understanding because he's led by the Spirit. So out of those books, we see the apostle who didn't walk with Jesus. So if it is so that the apostle stopped, then where would he give Paul the ministry of an apostle? He wasn't one of the original 12, but yet he wrote 13 epistle of the New Testament four of them he wrote from jail mm -hmm. Ephesians one of the most powerful church order from jail Philippians Philemon and Colossians from the prison and he was in joy when he, he, he said the joy of the Lord is my strength from these places he was facing obstacles was facing him but yet he said the joy of the Lord he said I'm a prisoner when he talked to Timothy, he said, Timothy, I want you to know I'm a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, by the will of God to give this gospel and this mystery to you. Oh, Lord of mercy. So, we're going to clear it up now about this. We're going to get a little deep now into the word of God. The fivefold ministry gifts given to the church. I want to show you deep in the Old Testament what took place. First of all, First Samuel 17, verse 40. You'll see a man called David, who he's a representative of Christ. He is just as a king is, he's kind of like. Uh, 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 you have Joseph at one point was a type and picture of Christ David you know so that's why they call him son of David he came to the lineage all kings had to be born in Bethlehem so all these fathers and these mothers had to place themselves in Bethlehem wherever they were Jesse had to be there Kish had to be there to have Saul because kings are born where? Jerusalem David had to stay there to have Solomon they had to be born in Bethlehem so, uh, and so these, these kings came for a purpose on the earth. So the kings literally governed. The prophet would hear from God and the priest would go before God. Oh Lord. So these three are the only ones who was in contact with the things of God. So they had to demonstrate. But David here in the scriptures faced a giant. I'm dealing with the fivefold ministry. Remember I tell you the hand of God. Let's show you somewhere else. Where it says, come on, man of God, listen to this. This is what he did. David here. Then he took 
his staff in his hand. And what does staff represent? Mm -hmm. Whenever you take the staff in your hand, guess what your staff is going to be? Moses, Moses was given a staff. Gideon was given a sword. Last week, the man of God said, Joshua was given a what? The speed. To, where you tread, I'll give it to you. But you're given the name of Jesus. It's your weapon. So he took this staff in his hands. And now he chose five smooth. Say smooth. smooth. He'll make rough edges what? Smooth. He make crooked path what? Straight. Anything crooked in the church is going to be the fivefold ministers who are going to straighten it out. God's going to use them to bring order or to put in place. Put things back in place that belong. So the smooth stones from the stream. Notice it's coming from the what? Stream, the source. The stream. Anything we need, we better use the word of God. These folks that come to us better come with the word of God. Because that's the only thing can put things in place. It's really Christ inspiring them to put things in place. He goes to the stream and takes these five smooth stones. And what did he do with it? He put them in his pouch of his shepherd bag. And with his sling in his hands. Approach the Philistine. The Philistine represent the enemy. You approach the enemy, you better approach him with the word of God. You've been equipped by the fivefold ministry to be sharp, to be empowered. To be empowered for great and mighty success. What does the fivefold ministry do? I'm going to tell you in a minute. You've been equipped by them. But he took five small stones. It had been said that Goliath might have had four more brothers. So what is not going to defeat just the enemy of poverty? It's going to defeat enemies of your faith completely, whatever it may be. Lack, sickness, disease, whatever it is, the Word of God is able to destroy it all. He took the smooth stone, which means God's going to use the fivefold ministry to equip you to be dangerous to the enemy. That's the Philistine he went against. That's Goliath, the giants. What is a giant in your life? What's posing itself today as a giant? Maybe it's a light bill, water bill. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your home. Maybe it's a child. What is your Goliath today? Is anything that stand in place making look like bigger than God? Always look like a giant. But to God, it's nothing. That's why David said, I approach you in the name of the Lord. Today you have the name of God. Jesus is the name. He approached with the name. Jesus. Now I want you to go with me. Now I'm dealing with the Old Testament here to show you that if you read the Bible, Christ is everywhere. It's ultimately the Bible, is the, the New Testament is a fulfillment of Christ. I'm going to show you now about this ministry that have been in the tabernacle which represent the tabernacle is is a portrait of a mankind it's a portrait of Jesus becoming human to win us even though he was deity so you have a, the tabernacle was set up outer court hmm? holy place and most holy you are set up body soul and spirit where does God dwell? In your spirit. The most holy place, your spirit. Satan is not allowed to go there. Once the Holy Spirit is in you, he's not allowed. He may harass you, torment you, do all kind of things, but not, Holy Spirit not sharing you, your spirit with it. That's a holy place. He's not allowed to go there. So you are set up in triune, just as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're in, in the image of Christ. When you look at your image of Him, so the tabernacle was an earthly place set up where worship go on, where the priest would go in once a year for the atonement sacrifice. He would go and offer blood upon the, 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 the place of sacrifice, which was the, the, um, the, 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 the altar where the cherubim sat over um, on the Ark of Covenant. So in between there, the two angels would be like this, guarded and protecting it, and the blood was poured upon it. 
And in the ark was some powerful things. In the ark. Yeah, Aaron bud, the rod that budded. Some manna was in there. Oh my goodness. I don't even understand all the significance of these things. It take me a whole teaching to tell you what these things really mean. That's you, the word of God. And the ten command the commandments was in there, the tablets of stone. So you are to have the tablets of God's word written on your heart. Jesus said, I'll come to you and I'll write my words upon the tablets of your heart. You are the ark today walking around with the presence of God. You have been given a rod of authority by God. It is in there. And these things was, and it put the bread, the manna was in there. Some manna was fed. Jesus said, I'm the manna that come down. You better have Jesus in your heart. You better have him on your tongue. You better have him in your mouth. Because he said when he came to Revelation, I have a double-edged sword coming out of my mouth. He was the double-edged sword. So you are significant of this holy person walking with this kind of stuff inside of you, like an ark. But the tabernacle, I want to show you a little bit about it because they have some wood that made the external part. And the posts and all these things that circled it was called shinim wood or acacia wood, acacia wood. This is the same as a shittim wood, which means the flesh, the outward. Up there is where the flesh was burnt on the sacrifice. And all the colors meant something. I've been able to share just a little bit with you. This is powerful how God set you up and he was showing you. And the holy place is where the, 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 the incense would be burnt and the presence would go up and set an atmosphere so you can go into the holies of holies. You can't get in there just like that. An atmosphere must be set. So you want to get in the presence of God? Set an atmosphere. Worship and praise and honor and glory unto God. Get out of the outer court. Into the uh, holy place. To get into the most holy place. That's where you hear the voice of God. Oh man, all the priests were authorized to go in there. Once a year. He, if he would go in there with sin, he would die instantly. They would tie a rope onto his leg. And when he go in, they would put a bell. And when they don't hear the bell no more, they just pull him out with the rope. That means he was dead. He went in there and sweat. You can't sweat in there. That means sweatless victory. Effortless work. It's Christ doing the work when you get into that place. It's not you doing the work anymore. That's why you can't sweat in there. You stop doing works. Jesus said unless you lay down that, you, I, you cannot do this. You must lay down your burden. And take up his, for his is light, his yoke is easy. Meaning the cross, it's easy to receive from it. And then now, you, you, the yoke means that if you yoke yourself to him, you do sweatless victory. Amen. You fight your battles for it. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Go with me to Exodus. And I want to start. Verse 26. Exodus 26. And I want to start at verse... 30. Come on, minister. Verse 30. Exodus, showing you something about the fivefold ministry. I'm going to show you why it's so important. I show you why the four gospels too. You know that four is number of restoration, recovery. That's why it is four gospel. What is the gospel? The good news. The gospel is the life and ministry of Jesus. The gospel is what? The life and ministry of Jesus. What do we preach when we go? The gospel. I'm telling you. Let me tell you now. Listen to this. Now set up. Come on, my God. Set up the tabernacle according to what? Plan showed to you on the mountain. According to the plan showed to you in the high place. In other words, the place where this plan came from is not a low ground. It didn't come from earth. It came from heaven. Meaning God sat on a mountain. That's the lowest place God came. Right on the mountain. Always had to go up to see him. When you go visit God, you better go up. God is going to call you up higher. He's going to call you from your low place. If you hurt now, you're depressed, you're oppressed, you sad, you you're stressed. He's calling you up from there. Come up to the mountain. I got something to show you. When you come up here, whatever I have for you, you will be strengthened. You will not go back down the same. Matter of fact, you, so you want to stay up there. Because Moses stayed up there for a long time. When he came down, the glory of the Lord was upon him. That they couldn't even look at him. Moses had to cover himself with him. So he said, come on. I've been showing you this thing. 
There's a pattern that God set for our lives, and if we follow that pattern, it will work. If you don't follow the pattern, you'll be on your own. Some people try to put God in their pattern instead of putting their life in God's pattern. God set a pattern, you follow the pattern. And here Moses said, make the curtain now blue. Oh, he said, red. I won't make it red. I like red better. Moses put them red. No. That would have been another God. Because these colors represent Christ. And what Christ would do on the earth. So if he would have put some another color that represents something demonic or something that is not. We do things our own way. We are allowing demons or other wicked powers to work in our lives. I say the curtain but maybe blue and the scarlet yarn and fine twisted linen. And what? Come on, man of God. With cherubim working into it by a skilled craftsman. Oh, my God. First of all, the blue and the purple represent royalty. The scarlet yarn represents the blood that would be shed. Only royalty, only Christ, deity, could shed a precious blood as this. The cherubims represent holiness of God. The cherubim that sat in the ark. Cherubims are what minister in heaven places around the throne of God. It represents holiness. And now the fine twisted linen represent his righteousness this is demonstrating what Christ who he is and what he will come and do and this tabernacle is being set up to show you this and know what keep going he's supposed to build it and what whose kind of people supposed to build it our unskilled people huh our skilled people skill Wisdom is the ability to operate in skill. When you are operating in wisdom, you're skilled. When you are operating in wisdom, wisdom, the next name for wisdom is being skilled. It's knowing how to get out of situation, when to move, when not to. Skill. You have the art and skill in living life when you operate in wisdom. So you, when you're doing things inspired by God, it's skilled. So you better, you, you on your job and you let God work through you, you're working skilled than everybody else and the boss will admire that skill and promotion comes from who? the Lord when you're functioning in God you operate in skillness so he's using not just ordinary crap man skill the Lord is skilled he knows how to win hearts let him and watch speak his word when you're winning people to Christ make sure it is God's word but no man can come to God unless God enables him so the word is able to do this and he said now hang now hang it with the gold hooks listen this is a curtain now that is hanging and this is going to be a veil now that would hide the presence of god so it shows you where the state of man was that god's presence was hidden from them because of sin god had to hide himself so man had to prepare himself to come before god christ now was the veil christ came and when he on Jerusalem, when he died on the cross, the Bible said the veil in, in Jerusalem rent. This veil that you talk, the veil in the temple rent. So now man could approach God through Christ. Because of the finished work, the sin penalty, the wrath was settled. It's like somebody, somebody you, you and them in the wrath, the problem. But you, somebody paid off your debt and then you feel free to go before the person now. Say, man. That debt was keeping hostility between us. I didn't want to face you because I know I owe you. But because the debt was paid, now I can see you. We can talk. We can come. We can go before Christ because this is. And so this was made specific to hide something. The presence of God. Hidden. Behind his veil. And so keep going there. What's happened next? With gold standings on four silver base, bases. Okay. Now, they're hanging here. I want you to say four, four poles. Four silver bases. Okay. The four posts of the cater wood overlaid with gold and now 
Listen, standing on the four silver bases. Listen this now, bases now. When you look at this four, it's going to represent the four gospels that Christ would use. His life and his ministry is the four gospels. That is what he would use. And now the post of Akeda wood. Akeda wood is a tough wood. Man, they use it to make floor. So it's a call of shitty wood. It represents outer or, or, or something that strong. But it's humanity. So Christ would become human. He would become human. And that's why we have his life in ministry, which is the four gospel. It's his life and his ministry. But he will live as a human being. He would be touched with infirmity. He, he said, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with us. For he was tempted, but sinned not. For he was hurled insult at, but hurled not back one. For he entrusted himself to the righteous judge. He was always dependent on the Father. He laid his life, he submitted to the Father. And he depended on the Father to work in him and through him. Can we who are flesh, who are the outwardly, we are falling and dying, Paul said, meaning flesh, we're getting older every day and flesh is going. But he said, inwardly, we are awesome on the inside. For greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So this four gospel, I want to show you something, why the four posts was on the inside, and I'm going to show you why the five was on the outside. The fire is going to represent the hand of God, the fivefold ministry who would take this gospel and equip the body, which is Christ doing the work. That's why He gave to these people to do it. It's Christ's work, it's His redemptive work. His, he went to the cross Himself to empower the body and to call some to lead to be able to empower the rest of the body. Oh Lord, have mercy today on this. The goal here represent his deity. And I'm going to show you what the bronze and all this represent here in a minute. But it was his humanity he would come. The deity Christ would come. And the veil now here that hangs had to hide the presence of God. But Christ would come and reveal and open us to enter in. Keep going. We're going to go down to about verse... Uh, uh, 37 here. Keep going. Hang the curtain from the clasp and place the ark of the testimony behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. The curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. You hear that? There's a separation between these two places. Your spirit man is separated from your soulish realm and your body. There is dimension. So when the enemy attacks your soulish realm, it's to affect your holy place. Because you have the truth in your holy place. You have the word of God in your holy place. You are anchored by Christ in your holy place. Your spirit yearned for him. That's why when you speak in tongues, it's the highest level of prayer. Don't you know that? Fasting is a dangerous place because when you get there, your flesh dies. Your spirit is strong. Jesus said in the garden, my spirit is strong. My flesh is weak. He were hearing from heaven and getting power from heaven. God was threatening him in his spirit. It's the spirit of a man that raised him from the sick bed. Proverbs. So your spirit man must remain stronger than your flesh. Which one you feed the most will bark. Somebody don't want to read the word for a week and expect when the devil come, you're going to defeat him. You're going to be afraid. Because you haven't built your spirit man. You haven't straightened up his arm. You haven't put the word in. You haven't prayed all week. You haven't sung a song of worship. You haven't that's what the spirit man want. It don't want nothing else. The flesh just want bread to eat, food, I want shade. I'm tired. I'm more rest. I want anything that pleasure me. Pleasure me. While the spirit man said, "Get discipline. I'm building your character." Amen. He doesn't. He needs the word of God. Amen. Oh my goodness! Come on, come on, man of God. Let's get going. Amen. Jesus, hear the word today. Put the atonement cover on the ark of uh -huh. the testimony in the most holy place. Mm -hmm. Place the table outside the curtain on the north side of the tabernacle and put the lampstand opposite on opposite it on the south side. Mm -hmm. Did you hear all these things that are given? They're illumination. 
That's what Christ will give you, illumination, be able to see. The table is placed specific. These things are specifically placed and ordered by God because that's what you need today. Now hang the curtain now with all these clips and place the ark. Come on, man of God. For the entrance of the tent, make a curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and finely twisted linen, the work of an embroiderer. Make gold hooks for the curtain and the five posts for akia wood overlaid with gold and case five bronze bases for them. Okay, the akia wood. Listen, remember it means the flesh, right? Or the carnal nature of man, the humanity of man. But he said don't leave it that way. Overlaid with what? Royalty. Gold. Overlay them with gold. In other words, my God, the glory of God come upon human beings today, you will never be the same. You would be empowered by the royalty of God, by the, de the deity of God. So overlay them, because this is what is going to happen here. Remember Lydia, anybody remember Lydia in scripture in Acts 16 verse 14? She said she, she had some things about linen, fine, and, but it was the color that she had with the linen, purple linen. You understand? Her linen represents something. The purple represents royalty, nobility. It represents peace. It represents devotion and wisdom. So what was saying that when she heard the message of Paul, she was attracted to it because of her heart and how God had structured her to be receptive because of her nobility. She was to anchor her soul in this. It, it kind of was telling you about her character by mentioning purple linen, what she sold. The blue here represents healing and the power of God and the depth and the trust and the loyalty and sincerity. Now we walk in the image of Christ. That's what it, the pure heart means. It's sincerity, transparency. This is how it was arrayed. But what I want to show you now is that the five outside pillars, there was five posts. This is a pillar adds stability to. These are the fivefold ministry. That's how they walk in purity. They should walk in, in divine anointing and grace that God has given to them. They're under the grace of God. They are there overlaid with gold. They have only because they are flesh, but they have the Spirit of God upon them. They're overlaid with God. And they stand for it. Now he said, cast five bronze base on them. Now the bronze here represent judgment or what Christ would go through. He would be judged by men. He would hang on a cross. And it represents suffering and sacrifice. Sometimes to get to these places, minister, it takes some suffering. And some sacrifice. Eh. But if you would go through, as Christ said, you'd suffer with me, you would reign with me. If you would suffer with me, you would what? Reign with me. And he spoke this. If you notice on the pole in the, in the wilderness, guess what it was? He said, get a bronze pole and put a snake on it. When the people look at it, they get bit with a venomous snake. When they look at it, guess what? They'll be what? Healed. This is the, the, the dimension of it today. What Christ, he would defeat the enemy on a cross. That's what it really represents. That when we look to the cross, when we look to the finished work, when we look at what Christ did, we can be what? Healed. We can be healed. Everything is in the Bible, is specific, and it's for a purpose. You don't just see colors just thrown around like this, and things just known, and, and what kind of material it is. So it is, it is humanity. Christ would come and die for humanity. He would take on the flesh, and he would take on you, become a human. The Bible said, yet he was rich but made poor, that through his poverty or through his coming, we might be rich. We will be rich. Rich in God. When you're rich in God, nowhere in the world. You might not have a dollar in your pocket, but you're rich because your king owned the earth in the fullness thereof. He could just send you to go collect something out there go get such and such he's coming to you with a million dollars today that's favor favor and name fear favor will take you from the back of the line put you in the front when God want to favor you he will let your voice be heard in a crowd your little voice to pick you up come on they will choose you I'd rather have favor than a million dollars because when you have favor you have favor to get millions more 
They even opened doors that no man can shut. There was ten leper that Jesus healed. Nine went away and did not return. One came back and he said, hey, where's the other nine? That means he was concerned about their attitude. They only got healing. What about their relationship? What about their financial affair? What about the rest of them? But when the one came back, Jesus said, because you've come back to give thanks, you go and be made whole. In other words, you go in my favor. In every year of your life, wherever you go, you're going to see a favor of God. Because of his attitude to thank God. Jesus, his attitude to thanksgiving. Oh, Jesus. Now let's get into the New Testament a little bit. Wherever you see gold, deity, wealth, power, God's love, and God's perfect wisdom. Okay? Wherever you see that color now. Mm. <laughs> you know, saying, uh, uh, my dad, my grandpa used to have some cups that he, he win the best farmer in the community. So they give him every year he win this cup. They give big championship cup. But my job was whenever they tarnish, I get to shine them up. <laughs> and I'll be like, why these cup things don't stay shine? Then I'm tired of rubbing this thing, shine it up. He used to say, why well, you clean the cups lately? I said, yeah, Papa, I did it. He said, go, go clean them up. I want to see the luster. I want to see them glow. Sometimes you're like that. And the Lord would send the Holy Ghost to warn you and, and start to shine you up. Because he's going to place you in some high places. And sometimes you want to get that, that tarnish off of you. So the Holy Ghost rub you. He said, no, Holy Ghost, you're rubbing me too hard. He's shining you up. And he's rubbing you and put you in the proper place where you should shine. Let your light what? Shine. So men may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. It gives glory to God for you to be shining. So the Bible said, if an axe is dull, much strength is needed. So the shining is not killing you, it's preparing you for the position that you are called to. Jesus. So, <laughs> somebody's running in the back of there. <sighs> Go with me to Ephesians 4, verse 11. Ephesians 4, verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. I'm going to show you something now. I think that this message is going to take me into a little couple of weeks. Eh? <laughs> I don't think anybody want to miss this because it's something awesome for the body of Christ. You must know these things. So Ephesians 4, oh, I want to start at verse, I want to start at verse 7. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. Hmm. All right, go ahead. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ appointed it, a, a, apportioned it. Apportioned it means a measure. Measure. So in other words, if I take a measuring cup, I might measure a little bit of a pint. I might give you a quart. I might measure and give you a gallon. But Christ knows what you can handle. Yeah. Eh? There's some grace under some anointing. You can't, you say, I want that. You know the price? I have my brother-in-law, Derek. He's a prophet. And I tell him every day, I said, please, Lord, don't give me his great anointing. I see he had to go through too much. Somebody see him up here prophesying, say, I want to be like that prophet. No, you don't know what he's making. In his making, he went through hell and back. There's a time that enemy was loose on him. And he said, God, deliver me. And the enemy, the enemy said, I will not move until Jesus tells me to lift this up. He allowed him to go through that process. You, you want Hosea's anointing? 
Isaiah had to marry Gomer, who would one day become a prostitute, who was sold into degradation, and he had to go buy her back as a prostitute. After he had three kids with her. Who here wants your wife to go off? After three kids with you and then become a prostitute, and then you have to go buy her back. And he told him, that's to express my love to Israel by buying her back. And it's for you to feel what I feel for my people. You feel that for your wife. That's what happened when you could spiritual adultery. He said, I hurt. My heart hurt. Just as the woman had committed adultery and his heart was hurt. God said, that's how I feel. And you can only receive that conviction because you lived it. So when you see somebody in their anointing, remember, Christ apportioned it. He gave you what you could handle. He gave you what you are designed to carry. No heavy burden, no heavy laden thing upon you. What you can carry. Jesus. Grace, God do it for you what you cannot do for yourself. This is why it says now. Come on. When he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. Ascension gifts, they are called. Do you know what ascension really, really, really means? To ascend. Ascension gifts is gifts that are given only by Christ. They are gifts that lift up. That gift that is empowered. They are gifts that you, it puts you in position. It puts you in a high level. Ascension gives me to take you from a low place, put you in a higher place. Where you at? Christ was in earth and he ascended to a higher place where he belonged. And he's seated at that place of position. So ascension gift is when he gives you a gift to lift you up from just mere man. To become a representative to nations. That ascension gift is making you. Do you know that you're a person speaking to you right now? If this were when I was a young boy, you would never, you'd have to tie me with rope to get me up here. Rope, maybe couldn't hold me, may break it and come down. <laughs> Listen to me. Only the ascension gifts of God and the grace of God could get me to stand here today. Amen. When you have an ascension gift, it's to position you and to lift you up to a higher place in him it's the act of raising or turning you to an important position i say again important some people take this thing lightly because heaven is calling you it's important there's nothing more important than heaven calling you because heaven can steal you where you can't move sometimes the hurricane come and everybody will close their store and sit in their house you can't even see outside. Nope. Batten down. And heaven, heaven can tell you to sit. And you have to sit. You can't move. So when heaven is talking to you, it's important. Don't not take heaven lightly. Heaven can sit you down where you can't move. So the ascension gift is literally when Christ lifts you up to an important position and a high level in him. He gave you according to the measures. This now when he ascended on high, he led captive, and his train gave gift. Listen to men, what this means. Rise to that position, an act of moving to a next different. This is talking about what he would do. He would deliver men, become the deliverer. He would not only be the creator of men, but he would now become savior. Oh Lord. He would lift them up because before he goes, he goes down and he preached to them and was ready. Believers who had been waiting, as the Bible said, um, the thief went to where? Paradise. <laughs> so he's in a little area where God is coming to lift, get him into the fullness of where he needs him to be. Abraham bosom, take him up higher. <laughs> These places are specific places that the Bible mentioned. But Christ said he was ready to deal with them. So he has to deal with certain things before he goes. And I said, but this is one thing he never failed to do. 
put people in charge to handle his affair. And this is the greatest thing that God gave, the hand of God to the church, the fivefold ministry gift. Don't let nobody kid you about them. They're important, they're positioned, not by the will of man, but by the will of God. I'm going to teach on this. I'm just going to finish up here in a minute. But I'm going to have to continue on this. You all need to come and, and hear this thing. Because you need to know it. If you're in the body of Christ, you need to know these things. Keep going. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? Mm -hmm. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher and then all, higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Yes, in order to become savior of the universe. He is not just creator, but he now is savior. Jesus, have mercy on us. Let us get this in our spirit, man, today, Father. Keep going. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for work of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of fullness of Christ. Oh God. So he is now, listen, creator, he's savior, he's deliverer and mediator. So he has the right to put things in place so that it will work for his benefit and for his purpose. And these are the people. It now was he. He it was he who did this. Not man, not Paul. Not Moses. But he Jesus. Who is the one who is what? Mediator. He's deliverer. He's creator and he's savior. He has the power to do it. And he put some to be apostles. Notice the some is before them. Not ever. Please remember this. Some. There, when I'm in the army, I don't see every soldier in the army as a drill sergeant. Only some. Some are given to be drill sergeant to prepare the soldiers for battle. To prepare your mind from the world, get your mind intact. And uh, if you want your kids given problems, just send them to the army. That's why the army said, make them strong, and we will make them army strong. They know why they're saying that. I was there, I can tell you. You will be straightened out, or you won't make it there. You would come back home and go right back on the block, probably be worse than you were before, because it would be a sign that you don't respect authority. So you probably not come to anything. You come back here, home. When I got there, all I said, what did I get myself into? And I want to change my mind. But I had to withstand the discipline. Now I understand why God allowed David to go in the army of Israel at first, before he make him king. Because here, something had to be done here. Some was given to be this, and it is to prepare God people. Did it say to write the New Testament? Is it what these office was given to do? To write? Only write the New Testament? No. It said they were given, it tell you the specific reason why they were given. To prepare. Preparation is your greatest friend. To prepare you for what you must walk in. The purpose is to prepare you for what you must walk in. So the level of submission to what God is doing to prepare you is the key to your spiritual success. It's going to take humility to walk with God. And to humble yourself on the mighty hand of God. The fivefold ministers. And I'm telling you, when it says it here, bear for work, so that the body of Christ may be built up until you reach the unity Meaning that we all think alike. We think that we all know that the cross is where you get saved. We all know that this is... So when you go out in the world and they try to tell you that you, you, you were made from... Uh, when you go to college, these kids go to college and people twist their mind. You send your kids off as a Christian to college, they come back saying, oh, there's no God. There's no Savior. 
So what the body is doing, it brings you into the unity of the faith. So we all think of the same, have the same mind of Christ. And the wisdom of God now is formed within us. So no devil can shape us, draw us away from the things of God and tell you otherwise. And it says now, it is done through the knowledge of the Son of God. And he wants to get you mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. What is the fullness of Christ? Walk in the power of the Holy Ghost. That's why I'm starting a new thing here at Pure Heart. If you don't have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, well, you're going to have to stay at the church and we're going to have to do the impartation, um, baptism of the Holy Ghost. We're going to pray for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I was in prayer here on Friday and the Lord instructed me start it right here. Make sure everybody in your prayer team is baptized with the Holy Ghost. So Silvana was here. Here's Silvana. She comes to prayer faithfully. Ask her what happened. Pray. She began to walk around this church. Man in the unknown town speaking. And I tell you, as soon as I got leave the church, Monique sent me something. I look on it. They did a study on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And they found out that these Christians are different from everybody else. They put them to speak in tongues and they hook them up with machines and they find out that their, the capacity of their brain has shifted. Not only their frontal lobe is lit up, but their back. And so it's actually like somebody's praying with them. They said they did it to the Hindus, they did it to Buddhists, and nothing like that was happening. Only their frontal lobe. So they are doing it in their own strength. But they said the Christians, when they do it, their back lobe was lit up. That means they were empowered by some other power. The phenomenon. Oh my goodness. One day I'm going to have to show you. But just after I finish here, the Holy Ghost said, do it. Start with the prayer of him and then start doing it to the church. Make sure they all baptize in the Holy Spirit. Those who have the great and the anointed and those who have faith to receive because it's received by faith. Everything God gives you is received by faith. So when I saw it, I said, I had to send it to, to Silvan quickly so our faith would be stirred up. I said, how did this woman know to send me this thing after I'm just here and the Holy Ghost just told me to do this? Everything that was given to God would come through prayer first. And that's the next teaching. It's going to be on prayer. Everybody please stand. This is a special service today. I believe God wants to do something awesome. I believe that the Lord wants to stir our understanding to a next dimension. To understand that there are some of you sitting here. Some are called to this dimension. But yet have not surrendered in humility to the call. You will be known and I'll teach you what, how you're going to know. And some, some people just don't know. Father, I thank you today. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and light unto our path. Father, we thank you for your grace today. Somebody, where's the, where's the instrument? Where's the, is Joel here? Your grace to stand, your grace to carry the word, your grace to deliver, Lord, your messages, Lord, right on time, scheduled moment. Let this be an awakening, Father. Let it be a word that will touch the heart of your children, that those who are called, Lord, they will surrender to the commissioning, they will surrender to the destiny that you've ordained. And those, oh God, who are called to assist, maybe to teach, maybe to edify, maybe to give the gifts. Lord, let them, the motivational gifts, let them use it for your glory. The manifestation gifts for your glory. And the ministry gifts for your glory. And the fruit of the Spirit, Lord, is what these gifts should operate under. I ask this today, Father, for you to pour your Spirit lavishly upon your sons and daughters here today. Lord, help them. Areas where they are weak, make them strong. 
Bless each and every person, Lord, to walk in that divine will and plan of God. Let their ears, Lord, hear the word and let it take root and the enemies not steal it not. That they will continue to understand and comprehend the grace given in your word. If there's anyone among us that is sick, Lord, you said pray the prayer of faith and the prayer of faith will heal the sick. Call them before the church. So today, in the name of Jesus, if there's anyone among you that's sick, we pray for you today. That you receive divine healing from heaven. Just touch the area of your body that is by faith. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit move among your people today. Heal your children, Lord. Deliver them. We rebuke every spirit of infirmity in the name of Jesus right now. We're commanded to loose hold on the body of your children. Lord, let it loose hold upon the believers today. Let no weapon form against them prosper. If there's anyone in any crisis or any situation, Lord, pray that you give them the strength and the courage to endure, to persevere. But they remember that there's always a way of escape. That they will never give up hope. I come against every depression, oppression, stress and strain and sorrow. I break it off now in Jesus' name. Release the oil of joy and the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. May the fire of God destroy the works of evil right now. And I pray that every person here is progressive, that they are fruitful, multiply, and increase, and that Lord, you said they should multiply. That means they should continually reproduce, reproduce, reproduce. In the name, of, I pray that their bank account will reproduce. I declare in the name of Jesus, their gift will reproduce. I declare in the name of Jesus that their life will be productive in the kingdom of God. That are walking wholeness today. Father, if there is anyone here today who's called to this level of ministry, whether it be the motivational gift or whether it be ministry gifts, Lord, or whether it be, Lord Jesus, the manifestation gifts that are used below the whole body of Christ, I pray today that you would act. let them surrender. Help them, Lord, to surrender to your call. And do whatever it takes, Lord, to walk in that office. The preparation that comes with it. Lord, I thank you today for grace to do this. Grace to live. Grace to function as a child of God. And if there's anyone here today that don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I want you to just, just raise your hand. A sign of faith that you believe. Somebody, somebody here say, I don't know Jesus. If you're watching on the internet and you say, I don't know Jesus, but today I want to give my life to Jesus. This decision will pray with you now. I want the church to help pray with them. Dear Lord, I'm a sinner. I know I need a Savior. I believe Jesus Christ died for my sin and rose again to give me life. Dear Jesus, come into my heart today. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins, all my shortcomings, everything I've said or done to hurt you. Now Jesus, come and live in my life, in my heart, in my destiny, belongs to you. Holy Spirit, come. Make your abode. Live with me that I may live a victorious life. In Jesus' name. Pray that prayer. Your life will never be the same. If you believe it with your heart and confess it with your mouth, you are saved. Amen. Join a Bible-based church. Read the word of God daily. Pray daily. And let your light shine. And when you become born again, it's the most important part of your life. It's a fresh part of your life. It's a new beginning. You're a child. One day is old. So you need milk. You need believers around you. You need people. So I say not the assembly. Come on out to church. If you're out there watching on the web. 
come join with other believers who can hug on you, touch you, and tell you how you look nice, and bless you, and see what's going on in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Glory be to God.